We're into our Becoming a Friend of God series, and uh, we started off with part one, where we talked about to become a friend of God, you need three things. You need desire, time, and energy. Huh. That sounds good, just saying that, huh? Desire, time, and energy. And then I broke down what they all mean individually, and uh, God was powerful. Then in the second part, too, we, we said there's three things you need to learn. And that is you need to learn to be honest with God and share your feelings. We said that you need to learn to care about what God cares about. And we said that you need to learn to trust Him when He asks you to do so. And then we went on, and I'm, I'm on the part where I'm talking about what does being honest with God looks like. And so last week we shared about Abraham. And we went on and we talked about how he questioned God and he challenged God. And we established that a friend of God was someone that had an open relationship with God. That could tell God the truth about how they feel. It has nothing to do with your obedience. It has everything to do with your character, quote unquote, keeping it real with God. And so now I want to expand further on that before we go to the next phase of it, which is to obey God. But this is becoming a friend of God. And all three of these, it's like three, three, and three. That's what, that's what I was going to say. All three of these are all together to becoming a friend of God. So you learn how to be completely honest with him. You learn how to trust and obey him. And then you learn how to desire him more than you desire anything in this world. You learn to give him your time, your energy, and your desire. See, everything starts with desire. If you have no desire, you will never use time, and you'll never have energy for your desire. Your energy comes from you fulfilling your desire. I heard T.D. Jakes always says that wherever your purpose is, that's where you'll find your energy. God will always sustain you and give you the amount of energy you need to fulfill your purpose. He won't say, Moses, I want you to lead these people to the promised land. Moses thought it was going to be a couple of weeks. It turned out to be 40 years. But God gave him energy, did he not? God gave him desire. Did he go through hard times? Oh, yeah. But he never stopped desiring to get those children to the promised land. He never stopped his energy of being a servant of God. And he gave his whole time to doing it what God has called him to do. So I'm picking up where we left off. I want to give you a little quote. Transparency and honesty leads to intimacy. Right there now. Because I'm just picking it up this morning. Transparency and honesty leads to intimacy. We're talking about becoming God's best friend. It's, we're talking about relationship building. Isn't that something even in your own marriage? If you're transparent and you're honest with your spouse, it leads to intimacy. No, intimacy is not just having sex all the time. That's pro bono. It's part of the program. Okay? But it does mean being affection. It does mean putting them first. It does mean caring for them and nurturing them. It does mean knowing what they're thinking before they ask. Ooh. Ooh, I love that about my wife. She always knows what I need before I ask. That takes time. Because see, we became friends. And we learned that friendship was the best thing we could ever do. And in that friendship, you have to have transparency, no secrets. And in that friendship, you have to have honesty. Do not be afraid to tell them that you disagree with them. See, honesty is not just doing what you want. It's telling you the bad things that I don't want to go along with and the good things that I do like. It's no different with our relationship with God. Your wife tells you to do something. If you don't want to do it, what you going to do? Well, I got to do it. Can't you have J.D. do it? Where call your friend? Can she do it? And then you voice your opinion about it. And husband, when you ask your wife, well, I don't feel like doing it. 
That's not my job. That's your job. But if you're honest and you're transparent, and even though I hate your honesty at that moment, I can learn to respect it and appreciate it. We always tell our kids, don't lie to us. The good, the bad, the ugly. David was a man after God's own heart, right? But yet many times he spoke to God frankly. And the word frankly or candid means just being open and honest. He spoke to God frankly from his emotions about God being unfair, God betraying him, God abandoning him. Oh Lord, why have thou forsaken me? Or if only I had wings, I could fly away. Father, where are you? For I feel your presence has left me and I have nowhere to run. My enemies are, are gaining upon me. Surely, God, if you don't come, I'll be lost. God did not slay Jeremiah when he claimed that God had deceived him. Turn to Jeremiah 20. 27, and Jeremiah spoke. The problem with Jeremiah is God told him to prophesy. So he went and prophesied, and then they put him in jail, his own people. In the sanctuary, in the temple, they arrested him, beat him down, and hung him on the gate of Benjamin and the stockades, or opened up his mouth. You see, Jeremiah was a friend of God. David was a friend of God. And Jeremiah said, Oh Lord, you misled me. And allowed myself to be, and I allowed myself to be misled. He said, God, you are stronger than I am, and you have overpowered me. Now I'm mocked every day. Everyone laughs at me. And then Jeremiah went on to do like all of us, friends of God. He, he was perfectly honest with God. He was perfectly transparent with God. And he was perfectly mad with God. And he went on to say, oh, sing to the Lord your praises. For though I was poor and needy, he rescued me from the oppressors. But yet I cursed the day I was born. He says, I cursed the messenger who told my father the good news, you have a son. He said, let him be destroyed like the cities of old that the Lord overthrew without mercy. Terrify him all day long with battle shouts because he did not kill me at birth. Oh, that I had died in my mother's womb, that her body had been my grave. Why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, sorrow, and shame. Yes, yes, yes. Jeremiah, was a friend of God. He was crying out to God. He said, God, we boys. You gave me the word of the Lord and I went and they beat me down. My own people in my own church. Why have you misled me, God? Why have you deceived me? God didn't say, God heard his cry. And we all know what happened to Jeremiah. He went on to do many more great things of God. Amen. And Job, Job vented to God often about his bitterness of his ordeal. See, I'm talking about people in the Bible that were called friends of God. I'm talking about not their accolades and their accomplishment. I'm talking about their integrity, their transparency, their struggle, the realness of having a relationship with God. I want you to know, sisters and brothers, it is not easy. And the worst thing you can do to God in your ministry is hide from him. The worst thing you can do to God in your salvation and your walk with him is lie to him. He can take it. He's a big boy. You're not going to break his heart. You're not the first man or woman to object to God's ruling to his authority, but let me tell you, as I give you a weapon of relationship, know that there's many more to come, and obedience will always accompany transparency. Obedience will always accompany disagreement. Obedience will always accompany not going with the flow. You still have to obey with God. But thank God he's a just God. 
The Bible says he's a just and fair. He allows you to have your point of view. And you're going to learn this because this is going to be the breakthrough in your relationship. It's going to bring that intimacy. See, what Christians lack today is honesty with God. We have cliches that we use all the time. We think because we go to church, listen to a sermon, that we have a relationship with God. Some of us try to ride on the pastor's relationship with God to get you back. But when the pastor's dead, what you gonna do? I guess some people just go to go to church no more. Why I'm alive, take everything that I'm teaching you. Store it, eat it, meditate on it, practice it. What I want you to do with everything that I'm always teaching you guys. This is like I'm always teaching you how to get closer to God. That's it. I can think of almost every sermon I've been preaching is somehow is trying to bring us close to God. Sometimes we got to get rid of our filthy idols to get close to God. Sometimes we got to check the condition of our heart. So these are past series to get close to God. But I'm always bringing you close to God. You know why? Because for 17 years I hated God and I was brutally honest with Him. That's why as I studied the sermon, I said, God, all alone I was right where I needed to be and I thought I was worse than I ever was being. And I'm going to explain that to you. And then Job, if you turn to Job 3, Job, he, he, he often complained about his ordeal after Satan came and destroyed everything. Job said, let the day of my birth be erased. And the night I was conceived, let it be turned to darkness. And then he went on in verse 11, he says, why wasn't I born dead? Do you know, when you curse the life that God has given you, it is a curse to God. Do you know that? We're not to curse the day of our birth. Now, they did everything but curse God. They cursed their mama. They cursed their daddy and their mama conceiving them. They cursed the night that they was born. But they were true. How? How don't you understand? Every person I'm talking about is a person that is in ministry. So you don't get this right if you're not in God. You just don't get to start off telling God how you feel and you ain't done nothing. Now you're going to get struck down. Every man of God that was able to view and talk and express their true feelings with God had a relationship with God. The title of the sermon is Becoming a Friend of God. And I open up with those that love God were called friends of God. So we're studying friends of God. But you don't get to have this until you paint something. Yes, go ahead. You can't talk on the outside if you ain't came on the inside. You can't have this relationship if you haven't sacrificed nothing for God. Yes. So don't get it twisted, brothers and sisters. I'm talking about people that God recognized as his friend. Anybody else, you might feel his wrath. This is what I'm talking about. Because I want that. Yes. I want that. Yes. And I want you to have that. So together we're going to learn how to get that. And even though in my 17 years of hating God, I was venting my disgustment with him of how my life didn't turn out the way it was supposed to in the ministry. You see, I gave him a sacrifice. So God is teaching me through this teaching. But all that I went through was learning how to be coming from God. Wow. I've been growing away by this. But remember, you must sacrifice what Moses sacrificed to have a relationship with God. Be frank with God. Frankness means open and honest. Frankness means open and honest. Being frank with God is not disobedience. Being frank with God is not disobedience. It is truthfulness 
and honesty in how you feel. If God gives you a choice, then why would he make you a robot? He wants you to tell him how you feel in his relationship with you. He doesn't want you to treat it any different than you treat it in your marriage, in your relationship, where you communicate the good, the bad, and ugly. See, we got them all wrong. This is why we can't get close to them. Some of us fear them so much, we won't even go near them. How you gonna have a relationship with daddy if you can't even go and jump in his arms? How you gonna have a relationship with daddy when you can't come in and cry out to him? God doesn't want that. He always wants reverence and respect. But what he wants, he wants intimacy. You can't be intimate with someone that you fear beyond able to speak to. You can't be uh, having righteous deeds and thinking that all my good works is what God wants. God says there are filthy bags I can care less about. What God wants you to do is tell him the truth. He's not going to change. But he'll change your mind about how you view him. So God has more respect for an atheist than he does for someone that go to church every Sunday. Hallelujah, brother. Yes, sir. God has more respect for someone that doesn't believe in him. Because he knows if you can change that person to believe in him, like Paul, he'll have a soldier. Yes, yes, yes. You see what I'm saying? They ain't gonna let God go easy on them. They're gonna question God, well, God, why this, why that, well, that's and that, and that. They're gonna ask God a thousand times. Well, I disagree with that, God. I know, I know. But Saul, stop persecuting me. And then Saul went on to do mighty things for God. But yet he was God's biggest adversary. Moses had a great example to us of being called a friend of God. His frankness. Oh, Moses, why didn't you just be too frank with God? See, when Moses had it frankness with God turned into disobedience, God dealt with him. You see, a lot of us only know two or three things about Moses, but you really need to read his daily activity with God, his daily interactions with God. Oh, him and God, they went at it all day long. Moses should have got beaten up a long time ago. But he was a friend of God because Moses was always obedient. And God allowed him to be frank and candid. Because Moses was putting in the work. You got to put in the work if you want to be a friend of God. You can't be on the outside and say, yeah, what Moses said, God. <laughs> And so I'm going to read one of the excerpts of, of Moses. And so you get a, a character, a view of, of what Moses was like. His frankness with God was almost too frank for some. But remember, you must sacrifice what Moses sacrificed in order to have that kind of relationship with God. Don't you want to just talk to God? Instead of wondering, is that you, God? Don't you want to be called a friend of God and, and actually talk to God? We read that Abraham, that three angels came and two were angels and one was the Lord. He sat down with him, chilled with him. How, how can I get that relationship? I got the same faith. I paid the price. Somebody needs to teach me this. I want to learn how to be a friend of God's. I'm tired of the church teaching the same old whack and nothing changes. I don't mind being disciplined. I don't mind being told to go and walk in the wilderness for 40 years. I don't mind serving God and giving him my time and my desire. I don't mind giving him my energy. But what I want is I want friendship. I want intimacy with God. And I want to know how you get it. Salvation just ain't getting it. There's got to be more to salvation. Yes. Salvation gets you into the party. Yep. 
Now you got to navigate to find your relationship. So I'm looking for God inside of my salvation. I want to know where he's at. I want to talk to him too. But you can't do that if you don't want to give him your time, your desire, and your energy. See, we talk a good talk, don't we? Yeah, that's a good service, huh? Mm hmm Going on back to normal life. Yeah, another week where God had no time, you had no desire, and there was no energy. But you had energy to chase all the other thing. But you had no time and energy for God, and you want to talk to him like Moses. So I'm going to teach you how to get there, how to become a friend of God. And then the rest is up to you. Oh, oh, please don't come back and say, but I waited for 20 days. And I really gave God all my time, my energy, and my desire, and, and nothing happened. I didn't hear anything. Oh, you already didn't mess up, fool. You went trying to make something happen in 20 days. Moses took 40 years. Jeremiah 60 years. You think a little 20 days is going to amount to what these men did in a lifetime? Yep. Mm. Please don't do that. God ain't sent across. Okay? This is a lifestyle. This is, a, this is something that you evolve, you morph into. This takes years, ladies and gentlemen. But you've got to determine when you're going to start. That's all I'm telling you. I've already started. I started when I was 21 and he called me and I put my football career to go into ministry. And that was my marriage and everything, including the ministry. And I started my relationship with God by telling him, I'm pissed at you, God. You took a promise from a kid and 16 year old in the dark. And at 21, you made me quit everything in the prime of everything I was doing to go be a preacher? And then you failed me, sound like David. You abandoned me, sound like David. You forsake me, sound like Moses. You deceived me, sound like Jeremiah, huh? And then God says, everything I did, I worked out for the better to get you to him. Look at you. You're not polluted. You're not deceived by everybody's book. You're not deceived by everybody's doctrine. You're led by the Holy Spirit. In one of three years, you've been given inspired sermons. Not from some headship that tells you what to speak, but from my spirit that gets stirs your heart. You're telling the truth. You're breaking the charge that goes against common religion that we've been fed all our life. And you're not afraid to do it. Don't tell me what I made you go through didn't bring you to what I needed you to do. Moses, Mike. Yes, yes, yes. David, Mike. Yes. Jeremiah, Mike. Because every friend of mine took the same path. But for 70 years I hated God. And I told him every time he would move above me. Don't touch me, God. Now I end up preaching for three hours. Don't, don't annoy me, God. And I sold cars on Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive to them but Jews and asked them, how did you guys become Jews when you were Hebrews? Somebody give me an answer. Nobody can answer that. I said, go ask your great, 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 I'm still waiting for an answer from those five Jewish car salesmen on Rodeo Drive. God would send kids to my fence, I'm high, on crystal meth. And all of a sudden, I said, no, God, I'm not going to talk about you today. Because I hate you. And I'd be preaching to those kids for three hours and they wouldn't even move. See, I tried. I cried. And I ended up right back here. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. My life don't belong to me. Even when I was done from crossroads, this bald-headed, broke-back little guy kept bugging me. With his wife. Here they come. <laughs> Brother, I found a building. Did I tell you to go find a building? Did I tell you I was going to be a preacher? Did I tell you I wanted to do church? 
Jesus? Did I tell you any of this? Then you go away, come back to what we do. I found another building. <laughs> Did I tell you that I wanted to do this? <laughs> I realized, Johnny, I wasn't in control of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so Moses, being frank, Moses wanted more of God. He wanted to see God face to face, not talk to him. Oh, see, oh, oh, Lord. Oh, my God. Moses talked to God every day, three or four times a day. But yet, he wanted to see him. Lord, I'm just happy to hear you and have a conversation. That's good enough for me. But it wasn't good enough for Moses. to the level of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Samson, Elijah, Elijah, Samuel. When you get to that level, Moses broke the mold, did he not? He got to that level and he demanded from God that I want more of you. He talked to God. He challenged God. Yes. He dared God. He said, I want to see you face to face. God said, but no man can glorify my presence. You'll be stricken. I don't care. I've been on this journey for 37 years with these wretched people. You tell me to, to strike this and I strike that. You tell me to do this and I do that. You tell me to strike down them and I strike down them. You give us manna from heaven every day. We see miracles every day. But yet I am not satisfied. You speak to me in an audible voice, but yet I am not satisfied. I want more of you, God. You know what, God? It's how you feel. I want to be intimate with you. Lord, I am a perverted man. In an intimate, caring, sensitive, supernatural. And he demanded that God show his face. That's really good. 33, we start with verse 7. And I didn't know this. I, I, you know, this, this whole teaching, I've been just blowing up and blowing and learning. It starts with verse 7. It was Moses' practice. This was a practice. Now, when I say wrong for 40 years, it was Moses' practice to take the tent of meetings. And he would set it up a distance from the camp. And everybody who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. So here's Moses. He would let everybody set up. They're probably at, this is almost 37 years, so they're probably at 1.7 million people. And Moses probably set his tent a mile away. And listen to what happens. And whenever Moses went out to the tent of meetings, all the people would get up and stand at the entrance of their own tent, and they would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. He went into the tent, the pillar of a cloud would come down and hover over its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Okay, stop. I'm happy with that. Aren't you happy with that? That God's presence would come when it was time for you to have your daily chat with Him. So Moses, what's going on? How's the tribe of Israel doing? Well, Father, I went and I, I had to kill about a thousand of them. They were worshiping false idols again. Hmm. But what about the Levite tribe? Well, they're coming along. We had to stone a couple of Aaron's nephews. Uh, they were drinking too much wine and having sex and raping girls. Hmm, that's good, Moses. Remember, they were under the law. So Moses was the enforcer of the law. <laughs> but imagine, what would him and God talk about? I don't know, God, I'm building a whole nation of Christianity. I'm, I'm starting the line all the way to Christ. I don't know, I got a pretty big responsibility. You know, I got to keep these 12 tribes in line. Judah's doing the same old thing, being a rebel. He's on his own, he don't listen. Okay? Imagine, what would God daily conversations? And then people that wanted to hear from God would come to that tent and Moses would intercede for them. Well, God, this is Bathsheba. She wants to know. And then God would say, Moses, Moses said, God said, this is all. Thank you, Lord. And this is how it went. 
closeness. There's no constant communication with God. But when we get to chapter 33, God is fed up with the children of Israel. Moses is fed up with the children of Israel. Everybody is frustrated. Moses thought it was going to be a three-day journey. It turned out to be year 37. And we're still doing the same thing. And guess what, God? They're not growing. They're not learning. They're not becoming intimate with you. They're not learning to love you like I love you. And so Moses needed a shot of encouragement, a shot of it. How he knows God will always know what you need before you ask. And so we go on, and he says this, and as he went to the tent, a pillar of cloud would come down and hover over his entrance, and Moses spoke to the Lord. And when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, the entrance of the tent, uh, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. And inside the tent was a meeting of the Lord and would speak to Moses face to face. Now stop. Face to face? Ain't that face to face? Well, maybe we think it was face to face, but it was still another burning bush. Or it was an angel. Or it was some figure that, that Moses would call God and God would speak through it. And Moses was tired of that. He says, I want more than that. I want to be intimate with you. But it says right here, we speak face to face, right? Okay? Uh, uh, to a friend. Ooh, did you catch that in the NLT? To a friend. They were friends. Buddies. They can tell each other everything. God rebuked Moses all day long. Boy, didn't I tell you? But, but God, I don't what, do what I say. And every time Moses struggled with his obedience, God blessed him because he was obedient. But the one time in 40 years, he said no. God punished him. So that tells me. And in all your friendship, and all your kindness, and all your frankness, and all your intimacy, obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't get big-headed, little Moses. I'm bringing you close to God so you can stay humble and respect God. But I'm bringing you close to God so you will be intimate with God and you'll have a friendship with God. One that is far exceeds your friends of this earth. The one with the Creator. Of heaven and earth. How do we become like these guys? This is my fantasy. This is my this is my quest. This is my destiny. I have got to teach us and I've got to know how we can be like them. I'm tired of reading about my heroes. I know that God has called me to be one, so I want to take the blueprint from them and be like them. Because it's my desire. And I want to give it my time. When it becomes that to you, then you'll be like me. Praise you for Jesus. Yeah, you know, you should take it. You don't have all the problems to with. And so then, this is what Moses said in verse 12. It says, one day Moses said to the Lord. So that was what normally happened. And then one day Moses was just chilling. And he said to the Lord, you have been telling me to take these people to the promised land. But you haven't told me with whom you will send me with. You have told me, I know you by name, I look forward favorably upon you. If this is true, look favorably on me. Let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor and remember that this nation is your very own people. This is him talking trash to God. Now, I don't know if Moses was an apostle. Oh, he just, uh, for all the other days, he had reverence and respect. But this day, he decided to just lose his damn mind. He just broke it out. God was like, you doing the same thing, Moses? Okay, how's Benjamin? How's this? Da, da, da. Okay, people coming in. And then Moses is like, look, look, man. One day, it says one day, one random day, one day out of the blue, <laughs> Moses said, you've been telling me <laughs> to take these people to the promised land. And so the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. See, Jughead, you've been looking for another human like you? That's why I already got rid of Aaron. I got rid of your sister. And now there's only Joshua and Caleb. I, I, I gotta be your best friend in this situation. Everybody I had to go to the promised land with you, they wasn't helping you. So he says, Moses, I will personally go with you. And I will give you rest. 
Hey, listen, Moses. Everything will be fine. Imagine what God tells you now. Your finances, your bills, the sickness in your family. Uh, you and your wife has been fighting. And your job's on your back. And you got unemployed. You ain't got nothing. Listen, everything will be fine. Imagine you and daddy say that to you. But God, I'm struggling with my faith. Right, everything's going to be fine. The said to you, God, I hate you. Everything's going to be fine. You're saying that now because you're upset. But see, my, I'm your friend. And from you as a little boy, you want it to be my friend. That's why you would always come and cry out to me when you made a mistake. You would always tell me, like, you love me. And I think at 16, you told me, but in my hands, even if he was an NFL star, he would stop anything. The whole soul. You see, because I'm going to be a friend of God. And then going down to 19, and the Lord replied, I will make good. I will make all my goodness pass before you. Because Moses went on to say that, well, uh, Moses responded, just show me your glory and your presence. I'm tired of talking to you every day. I want to experience what you are, what you feel like, what you look like. And so God said this. He says, oh, Lord, because I'm a friend, I'm going to take care of my friend. He says, the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will call out my name. And then this Bible says, yeah. I know y'all don't get that. But God is telling Moses, I'm going to let you know my name. See, man has called God a thousand names. But he's going to let Moses know what he wants Moses to call. See, the Jews shut that out so that way I wouldn't know the name of God. Don't you know God's name is not God? When he honors it, because he knows you don't know, but he has a name. Yeah. My Elohim Ikad. That means my mighty one, and he is God. And so he said this way back in Exodus, and he says, and he goes, and I'm, he goes, and I will call out my name before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose. I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly upon my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock, as my glorious presence passes by. And I will hide you in the crevices of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind me. But my face will not be seen. Stand up. The point of God, transparency and honesty leads to intimacy. Transparent about who you are, what's your motives, what's your intentions, what you hiding behind your back. Transparency to God. I have no secret sins in my life, God. I lay them all before you. I am completely transparent as I come into your presence. I am completely transparent. My sins that I have committed, I have repented of them. Therefore, I can come boldly to you, God, because I am completely honest with you. I am honest about the dealings that I, that I desire. I am honest about the lust and temptation that overcame me the other day. But I am completely honest with you, Father, about my faults and my failings, about my tongue, how it continues to cut and whip people down. But I am completely honest with you, God. All my sins and all my faults are before you right now. So as I come before you, Father, Receive me as an offering. For I come before you, Father, completely transparent with all my faults and weakness before me as nothing but a vapor of men, of ashes of dust. And I am completely honest with you, Father, about my comings and goings, about my disagreements, about my weaknesses. 
guess I want to be your friend. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to give you all my time, all my desire, all my energy. I want balance in my life. I want to be blessed and not cursed. I want you to restore me to that which was lost and taken from me. I want my spirit to be in you, Father. I want to be transparent and honest before you. I want to be called a friend.